No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. amen. The three highest goods enshrined in our country's founding documents are presumed to be, the right, be rights given to us by our creator, life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. But there's a danger here, and calling them rights means that they are no longer gifts. And if they are no longer gifts, then the danger is that they can become things that we fear, or that we love, or that we worship. This is the fatal flaw of our political order. We live as, as if we and our rights matter most, and God matters little. We think we have a generic deity who has endowed rights once upon us and now has stepped away, stepped back to see what we do with them, see if we are willing to keep them or fight for them. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. But again, if that's true, then the deity who bestowed these rights, unalienable, is irrelevant to us now. It's really all about us. And everything is about what we're going to do with what this generic God handed over to us a few centuries ago. But that's not God's word. Rather, the central truth of the scriptures is that everything needed for body and life is a regular, ongoing, even daily gift of your creator, you, his creature. You cannot be religiously attached to these quote-unquote, rights. They are not rights at all, actually. They are not good unto themselves, but they are gifts from God. And you are given to fear, love, and trust in the one who gives them. God the Father, by the Holy Spirit, working through the Word, His Son, Jesus Christ. You cannot serve God and the pursuit of happiness any more than you can serve God and fight for life and freedom. And what does God do when your worship is not on him, but on the gifts instead that he gives? He takes them away. That's the unanimous witness of the scriptures. Be it Moses, the prophets, the psalmist, wisdom, the evangelists, or the apostles, the unanimous witness is that God removes whatever and whoever gets in the way of you trusting in him. So whether patriarchs or the nation of Israel or even Gentile, God ceases to give when the gift is received apart from praise and thanksgiving to him. Again, recognizing God as the giver of every good gift. God gives and God takes away. That's what Job was given to confess as God had allowed Satan to take much from him. He said, The Lord Jesus Christ gives, and the Lord Jesus Christ takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How could he say such a terrible thing? It violates the first principles of life, liberty, and pursuit of wealth. Isn't that what God wants of us? Doesn't God want us to live and to be free and to be prosperous? Well, of course he does. But what if we cease to receive those as gifts from him, loving the gift more than the giver. Then he takes them away. He wiped the slate clean with the flood. He removed Israel into Egypt and exile, and then again later into Babylon. The Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle are lost. The temple was destroyed not once but twice. The extraordinarily wealthy kingship of Solomon fell into great poverty in only a few generations. The once free people were put under oppressive rules of tyrants and made slaves by their enemies. And the scripture teaches that it was the Lord's doing. As Benjamin Franklin once popularized, 
Our new constitution is now established and has an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except, you probably know, death and taxes. That's right. Now, it's not original to him, but it's true. He was correct, even as an agnostic or an atheist, whichever. There's nothing permanent in this world, not even our nation, except death and taxes. Of course, that's a confession of an unbeliever because <laughs> we know that God gives life. But apart from fear, love, and trust in God as creator, you can never receive any of his good gifts for your benefit. When they are received, as we confess in our nation, as rights unto themselves, rather than daily bread given by your loving Father, it's easy for them to become idols of worship. If we fight for life, liberty, and happiness without recognizing these as ongoing regular gifts from God, well, they can get in the way then of faith. And when that happens, don't be surprised if God takes them away. The lesson of the scriptures is that there's no point in holding on so tightly to them. Give thanks to God when you receive them. Give thanks to God when he takes them away. Nor are these gifts yours to do with what you want. All that you all you have that gives you life and breath or provides for you and your family is a gift. You're free to use it. You're free to give it away. But you must never think that it is yours and yours alone. When that happens, then your heart will be turned to love it more than the giver who gave it. This is one of the many diagnoses of what's wrong with our civil estate these days. Many have treated the civil estate's God-given role to protect life, freedoms, and property as something that requires daily, ongoing meditation, study, and action, religious action even. Our civil estate has its own scriptures, already referred to them, like the Declaration or the Constitution. And if those become sacred scriptures above God's word, then the benevolent state will be feared, loved, and trusted that they constitute. Those texts become sacred texts. The houses where the state rules become hallowed sanctuaries. And then they end up being our master, and we their slave. Rather than them simply being gifts from God to be cherished. As Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters. You are a servant, it's just a question of who your master is. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Believing that everything needed for faith and life is a gift from your loving Father is the only way. Whether you are given to experience suffering, or slavery, or poverty, or if God gives you health, liberty, and wealth. This is why Jesus repeatedly warns you to be ready to forfeit anything and anything for his sake and for the gospel. Life, liberty, and all that the world's wealth was, is, and will always be, is God's, not yours. It's God's to do with as he pleases. If he chooses to instruct you, or to entrust you with it, Thanks be to God. If he chooses to instead give it to another and take it from you, thanks be to God. Can he not do what he wants with what is his by right? None of these things, not your life, not your health, not your prosperity, none of these things are yours by right. The declaration is wrong but are given to you in his time and according to his good and gracious will. So, how does one serve God and not mammon? The church hasn't always gotten this right either. It's not always understood what Jesus is getting after here. For a long time and in many places, it was taught that Jesus here demanded that you give up everything and follow him. We just heard this week of the rich young ruler that meant selling everything and living a life of poverty. 
Now, if what God has given you has become a god, and you serve it, the god mammon, well then, of course, give it away. Get rid of it. Right? God will take it from you eventually anyway. And trust in God to provide for your needs. But that's not a universal prescription. Not everyone serves their wealth. But the church taught that that was true faithfulness. One of the highest callings was to be a monk or a nun and to forfeit all your property to the church. Then ironically, as we know, especially at the time of the Reformation, the church got a hold of all that wealth and even to this day is incredibly wealthy with property, immense buildings, art holdings, and hordes of cash. Not even batting an eyelash when paying out hundreds of millions of dollars in sexual abuse scandals. That tells you how much is in the bank. So they took what was meant to be charity or an act of repentance and turned it into another fundraiser, a sacrifice made for God and his church. And then somehow those funds didn't ever get into the hands of those who were in need. Now that was abuse, but that's not the rule. We are to be willing to forfeit, forfeit everything, be it goods, fame, child, or wife, as Luther has us sing. But why? Why be willing to give up everything that we have been given by God? By giving it back to him, is that curry some kind of favor from him? Or is it a demonstration of faithfulness? The problem here is that all that we presume that all that we have is ours to begin with and not a gift from God. Ours by right and not by gift. It also presumes that God just won't take it from you if he, if he wants to use it elsewhere anyway. Especially if the God mammon and all that we serve gets in the way of faithfulness to him. Or even more dangerous to think is that you might lose it for no apparent reason except that it's just under God's hidden will. That was just his will for you and he doesn't even explain to you why life or property or liberty was taken. Yes, it's true that God demands sacrifice. That's the unanimous witness of the scriptures. Whether it be the tithe or it be all the animals for impurity, the blood poured out upon altars. And of course, our parable today gets after that too. But what's the point of this parable, or all the parables really? We talked about this on Wednesday, but to reiterate, when you try to insert yourself into the parable, are you the master whose servant takes everything and squanders it by forgiving debts without asking first? Or if you insert yourself in another way, maybe you are the unjust steward who takes what is not yours and forgives it somehow by writing it off without talking to the master. Well, that doesn't make any sense. That's not how this world works, and that would be a waste. So that's not it at all. When you try to insert yourself into the parable, it becomes about what you must do. But instead, what Jesus is getting after here today is that what God the Father, Son, and Spirit has done for you. Namely, his church operates quite differently when it comes to material wealth. Here, Christ Jesus' gifts are distributed freely, even unjustly, here in this Christian church. Not only the gifts of the Spirit, thinking here of absolution and baptism in the supper, but even our charity and love for one another. You could not sacrifice what you think is yours to gain what is his anyway. You can freely give because Jesus already has given everything needed. He forfeited his throne, his inheritance. He even gave up his own life for you and for your salvation. He unjustly died the death of crucifixion that he would be more shrewdly give us everything that was his. And then God the Father, who knit his son together in St. Mary's womb, forfeit that life for sinners. And then he was commended by the Father for such a waste. 
as he was received to the right hand of God. It's Christ who's the unjust, the unwise steward, and it's the Father who freely gave him to forgive our debt. Not just 20% or even 50%, but all of it. Now that doesn't make any sense. Why would he give up everything for you and for your salvation? Of course, that's the point of all of Jesus' demands of sacrifice. It's not that you can do it or you ever could have the capacity to do it, but namely that you would be brought to see that only he can do what is needed for you. Only he can make the sacrifice needed. And that's what makes it such good news for you and me. The gifts of Jesus, be it his word, his forgiveness, his baptism, or his supper, are the true riches that are greater than life, freedom, and earthly happiness, as we already sang today. Whether we have them, or we lose them, or we give them away, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then also, no one can take from us Jesus' life, the freedom he gives us in the forgiveness of sins, and the joy of the resurrection. Not even God will take that from us, because that's his promise to us today and always. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus your Lord. Amen.